now for something completely different. My very first countdown that isn't about video games. Hey! What about me?! Shut up. This countdown is something special. As my first non-video game countdown, I'm presenting a list of my 10 favorite animated shows from way back when I was younger. I know what you're thinking, the Nostalgia Critic already made a list like this. Well, the Nostalgia Critic is 10 years older than I am, so I figure his list of his favorite childhood cartoons will be 10 years different from mine. And in those 10 years, cartoons have definitely changed. The 90s and the early 2000s got animation that was more customizable thanks to the advent of computers, 3D animation came into being, and more imports or dubs from other countries became available. Now, I'm gonna take you back and reflect on the 10 animated shows I watched as a kid that were the most entertaining, most revolutionary, and overall the most nostalgic to me. So now, let's start this trip down memory lane. <laughs> Tell me this isn't a cool concept. A show about robot battles in which the winner literally takes a piece of the loser for keeps. Oh yeah, Metabots was awesome. Even though the robot fighting concept was played very straight, Metabots was a unique dub anime in that even the source material was very tongue-in-cheek and was never afraid to poke fun at its own genres. The robot partner of the main character, Icky, is a sassy rebel who often fires back if Icky pisses him off accidentally. In fact, in a hilariously embarrassing start, it's pissing Meta B off that actually starts him up. Move, you stupid piece of junk! The characters here are a huge part of what makes this show so great. Some particular favorites of mine include Coach Mountain, a school gym teacher who has something of a Chuck Norris reputation. The kids at school call him the lean, mean, fat-reducing muscle machine. The bumbling thief Phantom Renegade, who is obviously the shopkeeper Henry, and the delightfully awkward Mr. Referee! Metabots, roll battle! In a kid's series like this, it shows competence to conceive and write something when the humor and overall enjoyability of it doesn't take away from the darker plot at hand. And Metabots had one heck of a dark plot at times. The backstory of the Metabot Roku show is particularly grim. He's out to kill the scientist Dr. Aki as an act of vengeance after Roku show is told that Aki murdered his creator. Plus, there's an underlying plot by the villains to turn metabots on humanity and cause mass destruction. But, even if you feel the story and humor didn't clash, there was still a lot to like about metabots. The action and the characters are incentive enough for me to watch this show on YouTube if I like. If you haven't heard of this show, I highly recommend it. Though, I hear its sequel series was weak. One, two, three, yeah. Johnny Bravo is a funny show. And the weird thing is, it's even better now that I'm older. Because in hindsight, this is a show that probably shouldn't have made it past censors. Johnny Bravo is essentially about a guy trying to get laid. However, the show was so well written that the more blatant adult jokes went under our radars and at the same time had humor that kids could enjoy as well. As a kid, I always enjoyed watching Johnny's futile attempts at scoring and getting seriously injured because of it, something that would have gotten old fast if it weren't for the sheer creativity in some of these situations. The celebrity cameos were pretty damn funny to boot. But no, as a young adult, I have more appreciation for the writing as a whole. The writing was just witty, chock full of innuendos and affectionate parodies of pop culture. My favorite episode has to be the one where Johnny meets the Scooby-Doo gang and goes on a ghost hunt with them. The episode blatantly makes fun of certain cliches from the original Scooby-Doo series, from Velma's constant shouting of Jinkies! Jinkies? To Fred always wanting to pair up with Daphne. Johnny Bravo was a 90s classic, and it is still funny today. But before we continue... Do the monkey with me! Come on! 
This next show begins in space with a big space federation and giant robots. They're fighting off aliens called the Glorfed that somehow remind me of the Vogons from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Makes me wonder what would happen if one started reciting poetry. No, 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 don't do it! Oh, Frittles! Yeah! One of the human pilots and a powerful test robot are sucked into a time hole along with the aliens. And then we suddenly cut to a fat slob who found the crashed test robot and customized it. We never see this space opera setting again. It goes into straight on mecha action and comedy. Yay! And it is awesome! Megas XLR is a series that asks the viewer an important question. If you had a giant robot, what would you do with it? In the case of Coop, he'd use it to walk along a highway just to get a slushy, and then fight off whatever alien menaces get in his way. This show comes complete with ridiculously awesome mecha battles, crisp hybridized animation, a super catchy theme song, hilarious banter from our moron protagonist Coop. Alright you alien chumps, you in my town, and nobody gets to wreck it. Um, except for me and some miscellaneous funny moments. One random thing I found really funny for some reason is where in one episode, loud Latin chanting plays every time the monster of the week appears. A tiny, invincible nanobot named Regis. Do not panic. You will all die. In every episode, a sign saying MTV, I mean Pop TV, will get destroyed. No, seriously, that's obviously MTV. Did I mention I love this show? Unfortunately, Megas XLR, like that other great TV show that had a main character named Coop, was cancelled after only two seasons. But even to this day, Megas XLR has a devoted fanbase in spite of that fact, and it's really easy to see why. With its high-octane action, off-color humor, and memorable concept, Megas XLR is a series that was both too good to last, and yet still has staying power. After the utter suckage that was Attack of the Clones, the three-year wait for Star Wars Episode Three had begun. The Clone Wars were introduced to us, giving countless more opportunities for the series to whore itself for cash. However, what surprised me is that some of the products of the Clone Wars actually turned out to be much better than the prequels. Specifically, Star Wars Clone Wars. Before the 3D animated Clone Wars series that's currently airing, there was a 2D animated show about the Clone Wars. This was an interesting series for several reasons. Firstly, the first season's episodes were each about only four minutes long, and were shown as cool little vignettes often shown when other cartoons ended. Second, if you combined the runtime of every episode in the series, the entire show would only be about two hours long, the average runtime of a feature-length Star Wars film. So basically, this series was episode 2.5. One of the first things you'll notice about this show is that its animation style is distinctly caricatured traditional animation, though with some 3D added in for emphasis on movement. Especially in the action-oriented first season, which centered around individual conflicts, this animation style allowed for many new possibilities for action scenes that you could never see on film. The best examples of this were Mace Windu's flashy lightsaber and fistfight battle, along with Kid Fisto's underwater battle. To complement all of the heroic battles, the first season also featured new villains whose popularity and general effectiveness would lead them to appear in future Star Wars media. One of the villains who debuted in the series was, in fact, General Grievous, who is actually shown to be a calculating, deadly, and extraordinarily cool villain in this show, before Revenge of the Sith made him into a hammy coward. 
time to abandon ship. The second season was far more character based than the first, and also had longer episodes. It only had two plots an invasion of Coruscant, which further cemented Grievous's badassery, and a spiritual journey on the planet Nelvon, which results in Anakin seeing a pretty foreboding vision of the future. This leads to one of the things I like best about this series, its writing. Aside from us actually seeing more of the inner workings of the Jedi, they actually managed to make whiny Anakin Skywalker into the character he was meant to be. In Clone Wars, Anakin is actually shown as a capable strategist and fighter, has a much more believable friendship dynamic with Obi-Wan, and actually displays a more tender, believable, and decidedly less creepy relationship with Padme. To say the least, it's a far cry from this. I will be the most powerful Jedi ever. He's holding me back! Even if you aren't a huge Star Wars fan, this series has plenty to like. The action is downright exciting, the characters and villains are Star Wars classics, and the writing was top notch. I haven't seen the 3D series, and I hear it's decent too, but the original Clone Wars cartoon is a definite must see. Now, this show is the oldest one on this list, and also the one probably made for the youngest audiences. Regardless, The Magic School Bus was a show that's nostalgic to me both as a legitimately entertaining cartoon, and as a show that made learning about science fun. Yes, in many ways, this show changed the course of my life forever. Because I decided to go into film instead of science. There was so much to like about this show, from the theme song by Little Richard, to the wacky adventures, to all the great characters. We had Miss Frizzle, the teacher that everyone wanted as a kid, the eternal punching bag Arnold, and master of crappy jokes, Carlos! Kind of eerie, isn't it? Get it? Eerie? <laughs> Carlos! The trips they went on were also really cool. From a trip where they literally experienced the water cycle, to a trip through the whole solar system. I mean, seriously, why were all my teachers so down to earth? Oh, Star. Okay, moving on. At the end of each episode, there would be a brief scientific explanation given about the phenomenon studied in each episode, giving kids the right dose of entertainment and education. You have to wonder, though. After going through all of these bizarre, almost trippy, if you will, field trips, how would such experiences affect all the kids later in life? I thought I was turning into a plant again! The magic school bus... ruined my life. Huh? Remember Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? Wrong generation. I mean, this one. Yeah, this is not like the 80s series. The 2003 Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles series got away with a lot. It was a Turtles adaptation that was more faithful to the source material, especially with its darker tone. This darker tone, however, never took away from the show's quality, in fact resulting in stories that older audiences could appreciate, and exciting action and adventure that kids could love too. The Ninja Turtles all have their trademark personalities, and they're all great fun to watch. Aside from the fleshed out action and decent amount of actual ninja fights, this series had strong, consistent mythology, and several compelling plot threads. Several examples include the episodes dealing with the origins of the Shredder and the Ninja Tribunal saga. Speaking of the Shredder, he is easily one of the show's major selling points. He actually lives up to his name here. He's humorless, looks like a walking armory, and is nigh invincible. A fact which leads to a pretty shocking plot twist later in the series. 
Though this show was very dark, this dark tone was often used to create intrigue rather than for the sake of being needlessly cruel. There's an episode dealing with the consequences of cloning, an episode that borrows directly from the Cthulhu mythos, and an episode that takes place in a grim universe where New York is controlled in a totalitarian state by the Shredder. The possibilities for adventure across time, space, and even in New York itself were endless. And as a result, what we got was a series that was always fresh. The series even paid a few good tributes to the original 80s series. I hate walking on my tentacles! Oh, shut up, Craig! Overall, this was an excellent show, with an outstanding feel of adventure and stories that took heavy risks. Though I never watched the show's later seasons, what I did watch of this series was the stuff of nostalgia, cementing it in this high spot on this list. One, two, three, four, three, four, three, four, three, four. I can't think of a bigger Marvel or DC superhero show growing up than Teen Titans. It was all about five teenagers with attitude that fought supervillains, all the while being displayed in unique anime-esque animation that would inspire more shows to try that same style. Somehow, this style really worked well with a superhero TV series, actually adding to some of the expressiveness and overall enjoyability of this series' characters. However, as a result of this art choice and numerous other factors, this series has drawn ire from fans of the original Titans comic series, who found the cartoon too light and soft compared to its source material. Mind you, I honestly feel some of these aspects were handled better in this series. For example, while the show had a never-say-die mentality that did get ridiculous in the episodes with character deaths, the way this concept was used when handling the name of the main villain added a strange kind of subtlety to the series. Slade, whose name in the comics was Deathstroke the Terminator, is a welcome departure from ridiculously Dark Age character names. Far less complex, and frankly sounding slicker and more intimidating to me. Speaking of, Slade's voice is threatening to boot. Chillingly provided by Ron Hellboy Perlman. I am the thing that keeps you up at night. The evil that haunts every dark corner of your mind. I will never rest. And neither will you. It tingles me. All of the Titans have episodes, or in some cases whole seasons, dedicated to character development and backstory. The most memorable character arc being Ravens. Raven is a gothic hero who gets uncomfortable when people get inside her head. This is all for good reason, as she is horrified by her own existence as a half-human, half-demon hybrid that is the key to the apocalypse as we know it. When this time finally arrives, Slade returns from death and does... this... to Raven. Your destiny shall be fulfilled. And when Raven finally embraces her fate as the harbinger of death, this happens! Lighter and softer my ass! Even aside from the blatantly darker and edgier episodes, the show did tackle a lot of serious issues, including morally grey characters, racism, and even post-traumatic stress. It takes a very well-written show to create a cast of characters that can be fun to watch and at the same time be developed intricately. In those ways, Teen Titans delivered. Combine this with the show's memorable character arcs, groundbreaking animation, and genuinely awesome action, and you've got yourself a show to remember. When there's boredom, you know who to call. Man, Pokemon. Combined with Power Rangers, this show practically defined 90s pop culture. 
I mean, there is so much that's iconic about this series. We have that awesome theme song. Who's that Pokemon? That awesome theme song. The Pokerap. That awesome theme song. The memorable characters like Perverted Brock and Incompetent Team Rocket. And that awesome- You know what? Screw it. Time for a musical number. Feel free to sing along with me, cause you know the lyrics. Like no one ever was To catch them is my real test To train them is my cause I will travel across the land Searching far and wide Each Pokemon to understand The power that's inside Pokemon, gotta catch a It's you and me Defend. Pokemon, gotta catch a boss oh. or two. That courage will pull us through. You teach me and I'll teach you. Pokemon, gotta catch a boss. Gotta catch a boss. So, yeah. Pokemon was at its prime in its first season. It had many memorable Pokémon battles, with special mention going to the gym battles, and also some genuinely touching moments, with the saddest episode ever being Pikachu's goodbye. Who could have guessed that you and I Somehow, someway, we'd have to say goodbye Now, I know what you're thinking. Why isn't this number one? I mean, it's friggin' Pokemon. Well, there really isn't much I can go back to in this series other than the nostalgia factor. For one, it is kind of cheesy at points, and while it does have its deeper moments, they were often few and far between. And in an animated series that became very formulaic like Pokemon did, those deep moments lose their luster slowly. But the thing is, Pokémon isn't supposed to be deep. This show was designed as an adventure series for kids, with plenty of conflict and action to keep them on the edge of their seat, and with fun, memorable characters to keep them invested. As a kid, I loved every moment of this show, and I admit it still makes me feel all fuzzy inside watching it again a decade later. Perhaps it hasn't fared the best with age on a technical level, but as a 90s classic, Pokémon has been practically vindicated by our nostalgia. I know exactly what you're thinking. A Transformers series where the alternate forms are animals? That is totally ridiculous! Well, beneath that concept, Beast Wars was a series that went above and beyond your standard toy-based series, and became renowned for its epic storyline and for being a generally revolutionary cartoon. This show was among the first animated series to be entirely computer-generated. I have to admit, it was really primitive in Season 1, but by Seasons 2 and 3, its animation became pretty damn solid. The heavy cost of this new animation led to another groundbreaking aspect of this series, a smaller cast. This may sound like a bad thing, but for Transformers, it's a godsend. Often in Transformers media, there will be an insane amount of characters that are constantly introduced episode by episode, making them harder to attach and relate to. In Beast Wars, a smaller cast of main characters also allowed for more time to develop these characters, giving the viewer more incentive to watch the show, at the very least to see some great characters. Which, frankly, was most of them. From Eternal Badass Optimus Primal, to Honorable Dinobot, to Royally Hammy Megatron... Yes! There was a ton of memorable characters that would later appear in other Transformers series due to their popularity in Beast Wars. This show was another that could get really dark at points. It featured a horrifying deformed robot called Transmutate, 
A Predacon who I swear to God is a robot Hannibal Lecter. Is that fear you're feeling, Maximum? <laughs> and several family unfriendly death scenes. Because the characters were so well developed in Beast Wars, these character deaths packed a huge punch to the viewer. Honestly, that's why I love this show so much. Its cast of characters was so diverse and likable that it made you care about their struggle for the fate of the Earth. It did have a lot of funny moments too, but they were used sparingly and often subtly, and were never invasive to the overall tone of the series and franchise. Unlike crap like this. I am directly below! And I'm screwed Whatever you watched it for, the characters, the action, the badass theme song, this show was fantastic as both a Transformers show and as a show, period. Honestly, I feel it's held up wonderfully. Beast Wars. It's an optimal achievement. Yes. This last show, as a kid, was the big one for me, and I have to say, it still is. It contains a perfect amount of action, humor, colorful characters that develop, and deep yet accessible subject matter. Ladies and gentlemen, Digimon Tamers. While this series of Digimon isn't as famous as the first series, I feel this was where the Digimon franchise became more than just that franchise that's riding on Pokemon's success and is indeed the best show I remember seeing as a kid. It follows the story of Takato, a meek child who creates his own Digimon partner and is called to save both our world and the digital world with the help of the level-headed pacifist Henry and cold-hearted Rika. Between their duels with invading Digimon from the other side, they gather more allies, enter the digital world, and eventually discover the source of their problems. Not before one of the villains brutally murders one of the Digimon partners in cold blood. Yeah, this was an extremely dark series, and with what it got away with, it's a wonder that it actually got released in America. However, as I described earlier, darker shows can work if the dark material complements the rest of the narrative. In Digimon Tamers, the increasingly darker subject matter flawlessly mirrored the development of the main characters. Each of the main characters and their Digimon overcome their personal flaws and improve as they are challenged by adversity after adversity, creating strong, relatable characters that ultimately deserved to triumph. The best example of this is Takato, who ultimately decides that he can't stand to watch anyone else get hurt, eventually merging with his partner Gilmon to become a powerful knight willing to protect all he cares about. The villains in this series are also appropriately varied, threatening, and complex, with the most memorable of which being the ultimate evil, the D-Reaper. The D-Reaper is one of my favorite villains of all time because of its uniqueness, being a computer program only doing what it was designed to do, delete data. However, it ends up mutating beyond its parameters and evolves into a terrifying abomination that learns to destroy the real world as well by feeding off the emotions of a depressed child. There was nothing we could do. I'm sorry. <laughs> The D-Reaper speaks volumes to me as a grim allegory for the increasing complexity of machines and their potential to overtake humanity. This is the perfect example of why this series is so good. It presents poignant and frankly relevant messages in equally poignant ways, done in such a way that anyone can understand them. In Digimon Tamers, there also exists themes of destiny, as presented through Jerry's internal dilemmas, and misuse of power, shown horrifically through Beelzemon's insane tirade of power absorption, and his subsequent downfall and redemption. But even aside from this show's excellent story writing, there is still plenty about this series to enjoy. 
The action scenes in this series are absolutely epic, with special mention going to the emotion-packed duel between Gallantmon and Beelzemon, and the final battle with the D-Reaper. We do deserve to exist! You don't! The humor writing's even very well done for a dub anime, featuring genuinely funny jokes that don't have to resort to lame puns like the first two Digimon series. One scene that always puts a smile on my face is just after Takato first meets Gilmon. I'm Takato. Takato man? Uh, uh, I'm not a Digimon. Takato. Takato man. Uh. See, in the end, that's why I love this series so much. It's entertaining on its own, yet it can still pull off a 50-episode narrative that's ultimately very rewarding due to the exceptional growth the characters go through. It made you want the heroes to win, making the series' action scenes all the more satisfying. This show took a lot of risks, but it was never alienating, providing a challenging yet entertaining action series that I loved as a kid, and a well-written story that I still love even as a young adult. Digimon Tamers. It was the show I looked forward to on Saturday mornings as a kid, and looking on it now, it still stands as my top nostalgic animated show. I'm the Autark of Flame, saying, here's to our childhoods. Titans go. You what? Come on, man, he was irritating. If he had irritated you, you would have done the same with your force powers. No, I would Okay, you know what, you know what? Being irritating does not justify killing someone with a freaking Hattori Hanzo sword! Does it matter? I'm sure the audience loved it! Whatever. Whatever. Just don't be pulling any of that shit. What? Now what's up? Nothing. Nothing. I think. Just, just don't do that again. I think. Maybe you need a movie. I just got Seven Samurai. Uh. What? Nothing. Nothing. Let's just go watch.